All right, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, my talk here, Migrating the League of Legends platform into the AWS cloud. I appreciate everyone coming and uh, spending their first session with me here at the gaming track. Uh, this is an exciting time to talk about uh, a project we did, uh, started maybe a little bit over a year ago, and then kind of go through the results about how, how we got to where we're at today. So before we get started, a little bit about myself. <clears throat> My name is Rob Cameron. I'm a senior infrastructure engineer here at Riot Games. Uh, this is not, unfortunately, my first job. Uh, I've been doing this for over 15 years in network security and systems. It's been my primary focus. Uh, I'm originally from Detroit, so for any Detroiters out there, uh, welcome as well. Uh, also used to write books, uh, primarily around security products. <clears throat> it was a really fun and exciting time, but now I take all that time to write code. Um, for me, uh, starting in the industry oh, many, many years ago, uh, my very first job was working in a security operations center where we did uh, management of firewalls for various customers. So I had two jobs when I first started there, you know, just getting started in the industry. They sat me down and, and showed me this reporting server where they collected logs from all these customers. They're like, okay, your first job is every day this folder fills up and then I, you have to come in in the morning and drag these files into this other folder. And that seemed really ridiculous because, you know, even though this was a long time ago, we had the ability to automatically copy files. Uh, so my second task was to build firewalls. Uh, in the Detroit area, we had something called the Automotive Network Exchange, which uh, every customer or provider to the big the automotive companies had to have a, a checkpoint firewall. So we'd have to take, sit down, build, you know, whatever type of uh, Unix flavor or Windows NT the customers would want. And I would spend about eight hours a day changing disks, moving around. Uh, and I asked, like, hey, you know, this is really repetitive. Can't I just automate it? They're like, no, you can't do it because we bill by the hour. So please at least take eight to ten hours to do this. Uh, so after doing that for a couple of years uh, and eventually again going out and deploying those, I really got passionate about automation. Um, for me, I think of automation and infrastructure as like a symphony. You start off with a few tools, uh, kicking off some different tasks, whether it's deploying hosts or configuring systems, and then ultimately all of the different players in the uh, orchestra come together, and it makes just, you know, ultimately a beautiful sound to have something deployed. Uh, I'm sure we've all been to that point where we used to go and install systems by floppy or CD. Uh, nowadays, again, I could literally right now do a demo and launch a thousand servers in every region in AWS in the world and uh, maybe hit a couple buttons. So I think we've come a long way and it's really exciting to see that. Uh, also, uh, love League of Legends. Hope maybe there's some fans here with it as well. Uh, Mr. Crapper on most uh, uh, different regions. Uh, and why? It's because I really give a crap about our players. So what are we trying to solve here? Of course, there's an end game. But for us, uh, League of Legends uh, started nearly around uh, seven, eight years ago. <clears throat> and then we had hoped that somebody would play it. And then literally overnight, uh, you know, the players in the uh, CCU or uh, concurrent user count ramped up and just shot through the roof. And people were just scratching their head and they're like, we've got to get servers everywhere all the time. And so for years, we were just deploying servers uh, you know, by hand and then through some automation and then eventually had data center locations all around the world. And this was great just because we were able to reach the players and meet their capacity. Then the problem came is now we have all of these weird servers all over the place, different sets of automation, different tooling we need to clean this up and make this more operatable uh, for the long run so that way we can most importantly get f more features to the players as fast as possible. Um, for, for those of you who don't know, League of Legends has done a two week release cycle for some time and what we want to do is always release new features, new uh, capabilities into the game and by having to manage and you know, get a server in some location, uh, it definitely uh, makes it very hard for us to do that. And so. We wanted to take what is a League of Legends shard, which is a geographically, uh, or geographically specifically set uh, location for, for players. And this is done for a few reasons. Uh, one, maybe some local laws around how we need to get content uh, into, a, uh, into a location. And the number two is most importantly is getting the platform and the game servers as close to the players as possible. League of Legends is a, a MOBA game where we have to have 10 players playing very rapidly uh, together. And then the lower the latency, the better the experience. We have some locations uh, such as in Korea where it's all sub 10 milliseconds. Uh, it makes me wish I lived in Korea because that'd be a great play gaming experience. Uh, and then some locations uh, like in the United States, which is very geographically diverse. And so we have a, uh, League of, uh, a target um, latency for around 60 milliseconds. And that will give you your best player experience. I can always tell you that lower is better. 
Um, but the average, at least giving everybody an equal share experience, I think is very important. So the shard consists of three main categories here. One, which we'll be talking about primarily today, is the platform. Now, the platform, a uh, very creative name, is basically all of the services you would use to get into the game. Logging in, chatting with other players, doing matchmaking, end of game statistics, all these key things come together in the platform. And then most of that is a monolithic uh, set of processes and packages. Uh, and so that became a bit of a pain when, uh, to migrate and manage, and we'll talk about how we did that. The other part is, is that to get players uh, features more rapidly, making changes to large code bases that could cause bugs, could cause issues, is a huge issue for, uh, a huge problem for us. So we've migrated uh, many of the services over into uh, microservices, and then we use something called the R cluster, or, or which is the Riot container engine. Um, this is a custom set of different uh, tools and capabilities, uh, and if you'd like to learn more about that on the Riot engineering blog, just Google that. We have multiple blogs about talking about that architecture and how it all came together and what it does for us. And then last, and, and to me most importantly, uh, we have the game servers where the players actually play the game. So after logging in, picking that they want to play a match, uh, they'll get assigned a game server, and then pff, you're, you're shot over and logged in to, uh, to that match. Um, and then again, like generally those are very simple to manage. The biggest challenge is how do we get them into a very specific location so players can have the best possible experience. Now for Riot, we're a global company and we like to think of players all over the world and treat them as equals. And so it doesn't matter if you're in Russia, if you're in China, if you're in the Latin America South, we want you to play the game and have a good time with your friends, and then also uh, you know, give you the best possible experience. So what we don't want to do is if you're playing in North America, for example, since we're here, we'll just keep the geography a little easier, uh, put all of the servers in uh, Portland, which is actually something we originally did. Um, originally, it was a great idea because we had data center space and very easy to do. The problem was if you were in New York, your ex player experience is not going to be very fun. So we've centrally located all of the, um, the servers for North America, uh, particularly around the game servers over in the Chicago area. Uh, and this gives players about an equal latency. Now on this map, we see three different colors, uh, one being red or the riot regions. These are all regions that are controlled by us. So I'm one of the folks who would be able to, uh, to maintain, build, and, uh, and support these areas. Um, the other two regions are our partner companies, one being Garena, which is primarily in Southeast Asia, and we do a co-maintenance with them. Primarily, they run everything, I would say 80 to 90%, but we'll often assist on various things or changes uh, that come down the pipeline. And then last, we have China, uh, certainly last and certainly not least. And this is run by our parent company, Tencent. So for them, we would simply ship the code to them on the regular, regular release schedule, and they would maintain all the backend systems. Uh, they do a great job of sharing how all of that works, none of which I will share today, uh, but uh, very easy for us to manage because we simply just ship them code. Now, for launching a shard, um, this is a huge Herculean task. Uh, the problem you know, isn't necessarily just technical, it's also integrating with all of the various teams. At Riot, we have the concept of tonal ownership. So if we spin up a team that wants to make the new feature, uh, we'll creatively call it Foo, and they want to pick using Scala and you know, some old version of Java or something crazy, uh, you know, maybe that's not crazy enough, uh, they have the total right to do that. And then they have the timeline about how they want to deploy it. And this is great because that team has the ability to take that code, maintain it, love it, give, do whatever they want to it to provide that player feature and are totally uh, given control of that situation. And if it goes down or has an issue, they're the ones who are gonna take that on call. Um, the problem then being is that you have dozens of teams doing a lot of different things and how they wanna do it based upon their time schedules. And this is just the reality uh, of how Riot works. But I, again, love it because players, or we focused on players, we can do what we need to to get them working, but we need to get those all aligned. So initially here, as we're going to uh, build an environment, we had to manage the configuration for each, each uh, location. Primarily, all of the platform servers were managed through uh, Chef, uh, and being Riot, we had to customize it a little bit which to get it uh, to the workflow we'd want, so we call that Merlin. So if you hear Chef or Merlin throughout the talk, consider them somewhat equal uh, in how they work. Um, so when we'd launch a shard, uh, somebody would go in and configure all of the various properties about how the shard would work, you know, certain values for the currency, whatnot. Uh, this could be thousands of different individual tasks. So someone would look at another, an old shard and then manually copy those over. 
Uh, this in, inside of my mind, you know, kind of hurts a bit because obviously humans uh, unfortunately make mistakes. Uh, things can happen where a shard's misconfigured, and then ultimately in the end, the player is the one who suffers from it. Uh, so this was something of a focus that we wanted to be able to fix throughout this process. The next part was, uh, how do we manage, when we're managing that configuration, uh, you know, how can we get people to actually utilize it where it's very simple for them to contribute back to it? So instead of calling me or calling someone else and say, hey, can you update this value? How do we get them to do that and keep it very simple for that process? The other part, and I use this uh, antiquated picture of a, a system here, is we'd have to take servers, uh, you know, pick out a build, get them shipped to a location, rack stacked, cabled, all of those various things. I mean, this is not something particularly new. However, when you're doing it against that geographic map, uh, you might have uh, boxes stuck in customs, you might have a language barrier of how to uh, rack and stack and cable it, <clears throat> and that would just be a lot of effort for us to have to do. So it was very tough, and, and how would we be able to utilize uh, a different service? And of course, we're gonna talk about how we use, utilize AWS to get into various regions without the rack stack uh, attack strategy here. And then lastly, um, because people are people, we needed a way to herd the cats and wrangle those humans together to get a, a more uh, streamlined process. Originally, a shard launch could take up to nine months to do, which is, is pretty intense. So you have to coordinate across all of these various teams making features, getting them to come in and do validation, getting them to ensure that what they want is set up and works, the correct operating system, packages, whatever. Um, that, to me, was a huge part of the, the, the process here in getting that shard up and, up and running. Um, so outside of just solving code, launching instances or hosts, we need to manage people and come up with a process for that. Uh, fortunately, we had another member on our team, Richard, who was able to do and manage that process, because uh, for people, uh, that may not have been the best thing for me to automate. Um, when we initially started launching, uh, we sat down and had some whiteboard discussions, and we're like, how hard can this be? We'll have a VPC, we'll like, connect it to our, our WAN, like, have some apps, and have some databases. No, no big deal. Uh, and this was a good thing to go through initially because more importantly than anything else is, you know, our, uh, Riot's a large organization. Uh, we want to be able to get everyone on the same page and be very clear what we're doing and what our intentions are. Uh, and so going through various cycles of how to do things uh, I think is really important. It lets different people who have voices around what they want to see get involved, and it gives us time to ensure that the final design is going to be important. And for me, a great, really good takeaway is, you know, if you're working in AWS, it's extremely simple to build just about any possible topology you can imagine. You know, take some time and like invest in testing and looking at what's best for your environment. Um, the worst thing you want to do is like, yeah, this looks good, you know, first diagram, let's launch it, because in the long run, you're going to have to pay the price or the pain for that tech debt if it's not the actual right solution. So after uh, do, going through this uh, type of process around, hey, what are we doing and what does a subnet look like, uh, we got very creative and spit up, split up into front end and back end services and then of course a database subnet here. Uh, it, it sounded really good at the time, um, but ultimately this was not the direction we chose to go. Uh, for us, again, uh, the iteration process is very important for us at Riot, so kind of explaining why three subnets uh, is, may not be enough or maybe too much, uh, I think was really uh, valuable for us. One important part here is that uh, the, the Direct Connect is a huge valuable service for us here at Riot. Um, the platform is just one of many different products that sit inside of AWS. And so what we want to have is uh, WAN access to various services uh, such as logging or um, telemetry, uh, being able to do troubleshooting and access into the host, various things like that. So through using Direct Connect it was critical for this project. Um, very easy for us to set up and manage, and we'll go over some of the caveats we ran into through this project. Now, we've kind of decided what we need to deal with and some of the challenges we'll have, both technical and, and, and people. But, you know, in the end, again, it's very easy to sit down in an AWS console, click some buttons, and boom, look, I have servers. Call your mom, tell you about it, like, tell her about it, it's so exciting. Um, but in the end, it's not about today, it's about tomorrow, it's about next, the next day. How are we gonna really end up managing this infrastructure is the really important question. So um, I've been using AWS since too long, uh, honestly, no, just for, for a very long time. And one of the things that I've really loved about it is it's really, it's all driven through an API uh, architecture. 
So when you're using the AWS console, that's the same APIs you can use to do just about whatever you want. Um, and outside of the APIs, you can, uh, the console, there's also a great uh, AWS CLI command suite you can use that literally has every possible capability, or if not every capability, almost all of them, you know, new cap capabilities come out and sometimes they're not immediately available. Um, but it's amazing to be able to do that, uh, to use it. But we knew that building this going forward, uh, managing the, through the console for you know, building and deploying uh, shards wasn't a positive experience for us because it's, it's a lot of clicking and you know, people make mistakes. Um, we also looked at the AWS CLI and potentially using things like bash scripting to be able to build a, out an environment. Um, for us, this was a very important thing to, to review with various uh, folks in the team. Uh, while folks like people like myself have been using AWS since you know, it, was, it was first available, uh, not everyone else was able to really understand that what the capabilities were or what you could do inside of it. So being able to iterate over from starting with some basic uh, bash templates and looking at how that works, uh, looking at you know, the command line uh, tool sets, looking at the, uh, the interface was great. And then we also uh, dangled in front of ourselves, well, we're all smart software people, we potentially could write this, these tools ourselves, uh, which is also always, in my opinion, a very dangerous thing to say. Uh, because again, it's not about today, it's always about tomorrow. And for us, tomorrow is always about the player. So if we make some garbage tools or things that aren't gonna work for us, uh, we're gonna pay that price in the long run. So with managing the infrastructure, we had a few different tenants that we wanted to be able to cover. Uh, first and most importantly for us is uh, treating that configuration as code. We want every change that we're going to do to be able to be tracked, uh, tracked down to who did it, tracked down to why it was done, uh, and being able to have also people contribute back to that code. While managing all of this infrastructure is very exciting and fun, sometimes when you're working with a developer, you want them to be able to express how they want to see something. And while we can talk about it in whiteboard, you know, honestly for me, uh, code is the ultimate source of truth because it has a definition of how it works. It has something where people can read about it and understand, track it, and then it's a user experience that they, they can enjoy to go through. So instead of having uh, somebody call me and say, oh, we need two more of these servers, hey, how about you just do a pull request and then uh, make that change on your own? Uh, and that you know, simplifies the process for, for ultimately the long-term support of this infrastructure. Um, at Riot, we have revolving teams. So uh, this was my uh, second, or this is my third project over at Riot. And when we're doing that, I may go on in three months to work on another project based upon where my skill sets are needed. So as we have people that rotate inside of teams and out of teams, we want something that no in one individual can own, um, but it's more owned by the organization. And so the harder we make that, the harder it is to support it. Um, early again in my career, I used to jump and, hey, what do you need? Like, let's build this, this tool in this environment. And it was great because we got everything done and everyone was really happy, except for me who would get the call after call after call to be able to maintain some crazy script or some crazy tool or, or some weird uh, albatross design that could barely get off the ground. Uh, and so I want something that, you know, again, I can move on, do other things, and then other people can come in and be able to take on that support. Um, so this is all great when we're thinking about just AWS or any sort of cloud provider, but there are regions where using AWS may not be a positive experience for us. And that's not specific because of AWS, it's specific because where we need to place servers. So uh, League of Legends is hugely popular, for example, in Vietnam, and that's somewhere where the closest AWS uh, region to us is Singapore, and while it's somewhat geographically close, uh, it's definitely, in my opinion, very far away. And so those are locations where we're gonna have to do bare metal deploys, and that's something that there's just no other way around doing that. And so while we're building this tool set, I would love to say uh, 100%, you know, we can only use AWS, like it solves every need. It just may not be possible. So we didn't wanna use a tool, say like AWS CLI, that would be very specific to that environment. We wanted something that would empower us to use AWS, but also to be able to you know, potentially use other cloud providers as different regions show up. And I'm sure there'll be some cool announcements coming out this week, uh, but uh, no spoilers, because I don't know them. Uh, but uh, you know, again, uh, like for example, Google uh, Compute Engine has a location in Taiwan, which is something that could be beneficial to us. Uh, those are things we want to be able to take advantage of it. And the most importantly, again, this isn't about me, this isn't about our team, this isn't about Riot, this is about the player. So if I have to do this and I'm gonna increase the amount of time it takes to launch a shard, it's, that's bad for the player, and that's not what Riot's all about. So we want the ability to very quickly ship and make changes as needed. So if I make a, a tool pipeline that takes you know, five days to do a change and we don't know if it works, 
it's not a win for us. And so how do we take all of that and, and build all of these tenants together into our tool sets? So the, f the first thing we looked at was how do we build AMIs and build images? And this may seem, you know, a bit strange because, you know, honestly, there's a lot of positive, you know, publicly available supported AMIs from different providers. Uh, Riot particularly uses CentOS for most of our Linux infrastructure. And of course, we do uh, use some Windows for our game servers, uh, which is not particularly applicable to this. Um, but we wanted a way to build a very customized AMI that was designed exactly how uh, we would be able to use it in a bare metal environment. Um, and previously, we used to have a tool called RIMS, or Riot Image Management Service. Uh, I'm sure at your companies, you all, you may name them uh, something based upon the company name, so everything begins with R, like much like R cluster. Um, and so when we did that, we had a workflow that people understood how we build images, and we required very customized uh, images. Unfortunately, sometimes we couldn't run uh, the latest up-to-date CentOS or the latest up-to-date Windows, so we needed a pipeline to be able to do that. Uh, we started playing and ultimately ended up using Packer for this process, uh, although a few of my team members who shall not be named did build some images by hand, which made me very sad. Uh, building this process allowed us to have our configuration for our images as code. It allowed other people to see what we were doing. If someone had a uh, strange or a legacy script that they needed to build, put into the build environment to set some kernel settings or whatnot, it was very easy for them to contribute back into it. Um, ultimately, this started with building the AWS AMIs for uh, this project, but we use it also for building some uh, VMware environments, VirtualBox for testing, and then for our new imaging system, we use Canonical's MOS, and so also they have a pipeline to build images for that. Uh, what's also great is outside of just our uh, infrastructure platform team, other teams also started using Packer for their needs. And this is really, in my opinion, where the wins happen, is now we have an, in not only a tool, but an ecosystem of collaboration. So if you're working on something that may be IT infrastructure uh, for engineering, I want you know, their ideas to be able to come out and their best practices to come out so I can use them, I wanna share mine with them, and then ultimately in the end, we build this very strong environment <clears throat> where we have a very set of uh, supportable tools, and then ultimately maybe the, you know, people in IT could work on this infrastructure, we could go work in IT, whatever it may be. Um, while this tool was great, again, there is no magic silver bullet uh, for solving problems. We did have some initial challenges around build, how our build pipeline worked. Um, most of our build pipeline is uh, done through a Docker Jenkins system, which was a bit of a pain to get set up uh, for doing virtualization and virtualized builds. So we had to set up uh, separate build servers with just uh, traditional bare metal Jenkins uh, and get all of that configured and ready to go. Uh, and then uh, building Windows images uh, was a bit of a pain as well. Uh, we have finally worked out that process for all of these different build targets, which is awesome. Um, but again, uh, no, no tools without its warts. And for managing the infrastructure, uh, being also fans of HashiCorp stuff, we ended up uh, going with Terraform after looking at some different tools such as CloudFormation, uh, Salt Cloud Foundation, I forget the name of it. Um, uh, for us, uh, again, definitely not without its warts, but we wanted that process where developers could come in, make changes, and say, uh, I want these different types of uh, servers or this different class. I want to be able to have a certain instance count. Uh, we're going to be ramping up a new feature. Um, and then ultimately, we have one repository for all our deployments. So it doesn't matter what shard where you fit onto that map or which AWS region. Uh, we're simply customizing an environment file with a few different variables, which is, which is great for us. Uh, ultimately, this has been a very strongly adopted tool within Riot, much like Packer. Uh, we do use it uh, primarily for AWS, but we also contributed back to an open source plugin uh, that we use for Canonical's MOS to be able to do imaging. Uh, the benefit there is if you're familiar with doing it in AWS, which a lot of folks were, uh, picking up and using MOS was very easy for it and also built our own pipeline around that as well. The warts, which I talked a bit about, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about the state in a few coming slides, is managing the state. For Terraform, uh, has a defined configuration, its saved state of what it thinks it should be, and then the ultimate state or truth, which is uh, what AWS says. Getting all those things to agree uh, you know, during its life cycle of Terraform wasn't always positive. I think we started in version uh, 04 or 0 0.4, and then now we're on 0 0.8 or 9. Uh, it wasn't as good in, in, the, in the earlier days and some of the problems we had. Uh, one of my favorites were is uh, developers, like, oh, we're going to make some changes, no big deal. We ran our build job, and then unfortunately our entire environment was destroyed. 
Um, and it was a sad time. Uh, good news was it wasn't production. I was happy it happened before production because I, I don't want to hurt players that way. Um, but uh, <clears throat> let's just say it was a very busy day. And in the long run, when you design on an architecture, um, I've never written a piece of code where the next day I didn't think I could do something better. Uh, the same thing with Terraform. You might come up with some different design challenges, some different things you want to do. Uh, maintaining that in the long run could definitely be an issue. Uh, so upfront, experiment, test different things out, uh, feel what's best for you. Uh, you probably won't always get it right because things, you know, requirements change, but think about that very heavily before you get started with the environment of using Terraform. So for the workflow of infrastructure, it, it all starts with code. This is where we define uh, what the environment looks like in Terraform. This includes uh, services from the base VPC, Direct Connect, VPN gateways for Direct Connects, uh, instances, ELBs, the whole, the whole ball of yarn. Uh, and so when we're building that out, we want to have that as our base uh, component. Uh, most people at Riot that are on the engineering side have some level of coding, and so they're familiar with the workflow of using Git and you know, submitting pull requests and the whole thing. Um, so with that, uh, we had a base infrastructure we defined in code, and then we would do a, a Git pull review process. And so this was just for, uh, hey human, are you making a mistake? Is there a potential issue here? Uh, we go through and then validate it uh, by doing an automated tool uh, testing set, and then ultimately apply it. Uh, this was done uh, after the deletion of that uh, shard one day, uh, so it was very helpful to uh, come back and, and revisit this. Uh, but I think, again, uh, it's important to have all of those steps covered uh, for your process here. And as I mentioned in the Terraform state, uh, there's code, the known state, and the true state. Um, these are things that you need to manage as you're going through the process. So if somebody comes in and manages and changes as a server in the true state or in AWS, ultimately when Terraform applies, it's going to like, this instance type's wrong, I'm just gonna delete it and go through that. So this was something uh, I would say 04, 0.4, 0.6 was very painful, but ultimately in the end, uh, you know, we did, uh, you know, the new versions have definitely helped working this out. But when you're doing this, this is something you just, I want you to be very aware of, like what your code is, what the known state is, and what the true state is. The known state is stored in a, a JSON file, uh, very easy to update and review if you have any questions around it. We store ours in S3 for the, uh, um, to, for, to ensure that it's there and we don't lose the state, as well as being able to have a back-end back encryption, encrypted environment, which has been great for us. And then anybody can use the tools all over the world. And then Terraform has a state inheritance architecture where I could define multiple repos, and I just simplified this to say, like, I want to have my infrastructure, my VPC subnets. Um, that has various outputs, such as VPC ID, subnet ID. And then in the next repo, say defining just web servers, I could import from there. And then let's say I'm building ELBs, I could import from there and then have information across it. Um, this was something uh, that's not necessarily clear in the documentation to do, uh, but I highly recommend it. So that way, if I have a database nerd or admin who's coming in and wants to make a change, they're not gonna delete the entire VPC and every, everything. So breaking that out as much as possible is definitely suggested. There's a book, uh, Terraform Up and Running, I think it's sub $20. It covers a lot of this that the documentation does not cover. And just a few examples in Terraform, uh, this is called HCL or HashiCorp language, it's just like a derivative of JSON, how I can define what an instance is, uh, or in this case it's a VPC. I go ahead and provide some variables, uh, these are all filled in through uh, variable files, and then ultimately create output artifacts so I can share different, different environments. In this case, it's a VPC ID, a CIDR block for the VPC. Um, sharing outputs is very simple to do, share as much as possible. Uh, definitely recommend uh, going through and doing that as you're building the environment. And then lastly, just talking about, a bit about uh, using variables, uh, everything is, much, is tokenized as much as possible. So when we're building an environment, uh, we're literally just editing a configuration file to be able to define what all of the different uh, values are. Uh, we also heavily use tags, and if you're not using tags in AWS, shame on you. Very powerful feature uh, that almost every tool can uh, look into um, and utilize, so you could define exactly, if I wanna look up a shard, I can just simply have a few tags uh, based on searching and then bring up the exact uh, instances or whatever I need to for it. Uh, so when using Terraform, definitely as much as possible, tokenize everything, make it very easy to change and optimize. Uh, we did this so that way we could do a build environment <clears throat> where we could have a uh, test, uh, new revisions all the time and tear it down. So things like delete uh, you know, the disks, whatnot, or do termination uh, 
uh, global termination protection, turning it off and on to make it very easy for that. We did a few uh, extensions to Terraform. Uh, we have a bit of a strange DNS infrastructure, again, kind of comes off of our legacy. So we use PowerDNS for that. Uh, we modified uh, PowerDNS, the built-in plugin, to be able to support JWT authentication. We did this uh, primarily because PowerDNS has a singular API key, or at least our deployment did. So now we have a better way to be able to use uh, authentication to manage DNS infrastructure. Uh, the same thing with F5s. Um, some environments we have F5s as edge load balancers, and then this would allow us to build up instances, create the VIPs for them, uh, auto-populate the servers, everything uh, like that. Uh, so it's a very st st uh, streamlined process, uh, similar to an ELB. And then lastly, uh, we ended up contributing back to a MOS provider with, for building images and building environments like that. Um, very simple to do, uh, very, uh, very easy to extend Terraform. Um, we ultimately ended up uh, canning PowerDNS and F5 uh, due to a bug in Terraform where it would reorder a list and then always delete and recreate the servers, which would create player pain and downtime, and we don't want that, so we ended up canning that and built separate tools to manage those different processes. Uh, and mentioning tools, uh, for me, I am unfortunately the guy who always is like, I can write that, which is really fun until you have to maintain it six or nine months later and you're really bored with it. So whenever you're trying to choose which tools to build, uh, we could have definitely built our own Terraform and or Packer type of tools. I would rather contribute back to tools that exist and make a stronger ecosystem. Uh, it's very easy to do the, that today in today's world with things like GitHub or Bitbucket. Um, so definitely always suggest that. When all else fails and you cannot find a tool that meets your needs or more importantly meets the needs of how your organization works, which I think is the secret of automation, um, th then that's when you wanna look into it and then look at committing into a specific tools. For a lot of our tooling uh, at Riot, uh, we use Golang, and even for some back-end microservices. Uh, Golang does not officially endorse Riot, uh, just with the image there, but uh, we definitely endorse them and, and love using the tool sets for it. Um, things we use it for, uh, simple command line tools. <clears throat> Uh, microservices, which are uh, focused on being able to work with the players, and then using various sidecars, which are you know, processes that are used for monitoring. Uh, we have a generic sidecar, which we've created, so it's very simple. If you have a REST API, you define a little bit of JSON, and automatically you can manage or monitor all of your uh, environments with that type of tool set. <clears throat> Super powerful for us. Ultimately, for this project, um, we made a few different tools to solve our issues here, one being managing the chef data bags and or Merlin data bags, as I mentioned. Um, but instead of doing that by hand, we define those in a JSON type of object. And then a tool echo will go through, read it, and then set and configure everything in our, in our Merlin systems. Uh, if you're not familiar with League of Legends, Echo is a character who has the ability to travel back in time, so if you're about to die, you can just zip back and not be dead, which is a good strategy in the game, not to die. Uh, and so it's the boy who shattered time, and so we uh, used his name here. Uh, unfortunately, not, not a good choice, because then if you're searching for Echo, you see every Echo bug and not these tools. Uh, but very, very cool at the time when we were doing it, maybe, maybe working too hard that night. Um, the same thing for uh, the uh, F5 VIPs. We manage all of that through uh, Echo Edge, which just, again, reads the AWS tags. We'll go ahead and configure the VIPs for you. Uh, very quick to do. It's not something we need to update all the time. And then lastly, a similar process for DNS. Read the tags, configure the DNS, acquiesce, and make sure everything's configured correctly. All right, now to the meat or the interesting stuff here, the architecture that we ultimately went with for the platform. Here what we have is a generic uh, design that kind of shows what we would build in a specific AWS region. Uh, a region may contain one or more platforms. Uh, that always depends on what the player's needs are for that location. And then for the platforms, we have a shared set of tools, which includes things like chef servers, uh, DNS, and whatnot. We'll go a bit over there. And then also when we're launching a platform, I do not want the, I've launched it and the players are logging in and it melts down time. That is a sad time. We do not want that. Uh, players are very excited when these things happen. We did never want to have an experience where they get in and then it doesn't work and then we're down for six hours pulling our hair out. I have definitely done that at other places. I am not a fan of that. So we also have an ability to uh, load test a shard uh, in a platform to make sure everything's going to work for us. And so we do that with some mock game servers and test clients, which we'll explain. All of this interconnects to the Riot WAN over Direct Connects, so different platforms can talk to them, uh, each other as needed. And then we have the production game servers, which are located regionally, wherever is the best for the player. 
our cluster, which is typically done in metal. Uh, we're looking at moving that into AWS as well. And then uh, the internet, of course, which because you have to get to the game. Um, if you're not familiar, Riot also builds its own global WAN or global internet called Riot Direct, also on the Riot Engineering blog, many discussions around it. Uh, and we, that is used to give lowest latency and access for players. And all of this comes together to make uh, the architecture for which we're built. Uh, the shared services, uh, I was very, very creative this day, uh, uh, not unfortunately as creative as I, when I, we named the thing Echo. Uh, we call this the Tools VPC. Uh, you feel free to use that, no copyright. Uh, and then this is just a shared set of services that the shard is able to utilize. Uh, DNS, because we use our uh, custom DNS infrastructure. NTP, because time sync is super critical for messaging and validating everything is connected together. Uh, our Chef slash Merlin devices. We split these across multiple uh, VPC subnets to provide resiliency, and then also provide a simple uh, proxy solution for uh, services to get in and out to the internet where applicable. The platform, uh, this is where we break apart all of our platform services. We brought like services together into subnets, uh, and then this made it simpler for manage management and for people to identify how things looked. Uh, we could have done it and cut this any, any which way, um, but ultimately managing security groups between different subnets was a lot easier. Uh, managing this uh, logically for how we used to manage it uh, makes a lot of sense for us. Um, there was additional breakout here and some secrets in how we do things. Uh, we can't lift the, uh, the veil too much just to, because we want to provide uh, players the best stability and no security, security vulnerabilities, a great security talk later from Riot as well. Um, so that's something that you'd want to do. Um, when this was pen tested, this became the most secure Riot platform ever. And that's something I was really proud of and happy to do. Done through AWS security groups, uh, done through the additional auditing that can be done through the configuration and code. Um, for me, I never want to have players le information leaked or passwords or any of that, sh those shenanigans that people uh, apparently love to do. Um, so after the pen test, Riot's most secure platforms, very happy and proud with uh, how we achieved that. This also connects back to the tools VPC so we can get all of those various services. We could have built this into the platform, but we wanted uh, just how we built the system to be able to take tools and break that out into a different uh, methodology of how we're building it. So we build tools VPC, we build our AMIs, build all our configurations, um, that it becomes our anchor, and then platforms can come and go as needed because platforms may need to uh, move based upon AWS region availability. So unfortunately, um, we, we didn't decide very well on using our CIDR blocks and how we defined everything. Uh, so originally we decided on a slash 22 and then carved that up. Uh, and then we had some issues where we lost EBS volumes. And then the concern was, well, we, our databases are gonna go down, players are gonna be sad. Uh, so we ended up employing a, a different uh, HA uh, database solution. And that requires multiple ELBs. Uh, each ELB took eight IPs. And then after one database, I think we ate up in our entire IP space. So again, when you're designing this, Try to design for the future because otherwise you're going to have to go back and retrofit uh, additional VPCs or additional environments uh, where possible. Uh, we could have used services like Aurora or other AWS uh, services like RDS. Again, unfortunately, because we're deploying to uh, both AWS and bare metal regions, we wanted to provide an agnostic solution to solve that. So again, when deciding on how to build all of this out, please take the time to decide up front. Uh, this led to some additional VPC work inside of Terraform, uh, and then also the effort to bring up each shard that we had already launched uh, back so it's all in a consistent state. Uh, we didn't expect uh, at first for having these EBS issues. Uh, we only had a few in the beginning and have not had any sense, but of course it's on the production databases. Of course it's the most painful point. Uh, you know, these things happen. I don't, I don't particularly know how, but it always seems to do that. Now, when bringing up that environment, I want to be damn sure it's going to work. So through Terraform, we procedurally generate a load testing harness to be able to test anywhere from 10,000 to a million plus uh, concurrent user base. This uses a, a Java uh, library that we have to be able to go through as if a player were logging in, uh, you know, get match information, go to the store, all the player type of actions, and then go into a game. Now, uh, the, that uh, process does not actually play a game nor win, it just simulates that it's in a game, but we wanna test that ramp up. 
So if we open a shard, say, after maintenance, and then we go from zero players you know, to 10, to 100, to 200,000, we want to ensure that process is very smooth and there's no surprises. Uh, because the worst thing is, again, uh, we've all played games that have launched and have had issues. These things happen, and knock on wood, they don't happen to us, but I'm sure, sure will happen again sometime. Uh, we want to validate it as much as possible by going through the load testing. In, uh, we launch uh, the subnet A through Y, so 25 subnets. Uh, we do this because as we're doing the te uh, connection testing, we were generating so many different TCP connections that it became uh, very stressful on the AWS uh, NAT gateways. And so then this led to tests failing and then you know, losing time on compute and costing additional uh, money. So we just spread it as wide as possible to build. Um, for building and launching this with Terraform, I think it, took, uh, it takes maybe five to 10 minutes at the most, or really whatever time it takes for me to go to get a coffee and come back, uh, and it's done by the time I come back. And then boom, the load test harness is up and running. I'm able to tweak how many subnets and how many hosts per subnet uh, very simply, and then uh, by modifying a configuration file. So then once handing it off to other platform engineers, I'm like, hey, change this from a five to a six or a two to a three, go ahead and run this Jenkins job, it'll build out the environment kick off the tests. And then if they want to stop and start the test, because again, issue, issues can happen, um, we don't have to rebuild this every time. We just have a simple script, stop, start, load environment, which simply stops the instances or starts them accordingly. And then it'll come back up and, and pull its configuration. Uh, so that was amazing for us to do. Uh, this also connects back into the tools VPC, but does not connect into the platform. It has another process to get through that, which we'll show here in a moment. And then uh, gaming isn't gaming without a game server. And so we wanted to be able to mock that up and build that in an environment. The reality is a lot of the environments we had had exi existing bare metal production game servers, which players were already playing on. And so we don't want to eliminate their opportunity to play or the eliminate the opportunity to scale on a weekend where we launch a new feature. Um, so we spin up our own game servers. Uh, these are all done with Windows. We built this Windows image using Packer and then simply spin it up. It does not run actually the game code and you know, the bots don't play it or anything, although that would sound very fun to do. Um, it just simulates a player goes into a game or 10 players go into a game. They run for a period of time between uh, 20 to 40 minutes uh, and then the game server uh, you know, uh, the game ends, bots win and lose, or the uh, processes win and lose, and then ultimately the end of game stats are sent uh, back to the platform. <clears throat> uh, what's nice about this is as we were testing it, uh, we could scale and do different dimensions that we couldn't do before. Because before we had to buy the game servers, rack, stack, we're gonna only pick so many due to you know, costing or how many uh, racks we can get in a space. We're able to do new dimensions and new testing on this. And so through doing that, it was ultimately able, allowed, uh, allowed us to uh, optimize the platform, give us the best possible experience for the player and uh, reducing the amount of uh, game servers, reducing the amount of, uh, of instances in the platform, but right sizing it to have the right type of server. So instead of buying all of the same server, shipping it somewhere, and then maybe having a server overutilized or underutilized, we're able to right size everything in the environment. <clears throat> and this was a, a quick win that was very, you know, Obvious maybe after the fact, but not expected, so that we, we can ensure everything would be working appropriately for the player. Uh, we do a lot of our load testing environments in a similar manner now, and so that allows us to test and determine what type of server we're going to utilize in the future, uh, or how we're going to uh, do the testing. Uh, so this was a, a fun win that, you know, unfortunately, but we didn't expect, but we're very grateful to have. Now again, I mentioned uh, connecting into, with Direct Connect as being critical for us. Uh, I can't stress this enough. Um, because we have uh, data centers all over the world, uh, we want to be able to ensure that we have connectivity to them, some uh, legacy services, some shared services. For, so for things like um, if you're doing a transfer between region A to region B, that's a, sh a service that wouldn't be specific to one different shard. It's something that may be in a centralized data center or multiple data centers. So connecting into the Riot Direct WAN was critical for this. We used uh, a minimum of two 10 gig links to more than that, we'll say, so like maybe four or six. 
We hope uh, there's a special announcement later for a 100 gig link. I don't know if that will happen. Uh, but anyways, we can still do link aggregation for it. Uh, this was a huge win for us because, again, we're able to plug in. Uh, the way this works, if you have not used this feature, is you have a physical link that exists in some sort of data center location. Uh, so you get a cross-connect between a riot, uh, or not a riot, maybe it would all work for riot, between your router and the AWS router. And then that will provision that different interface physically, the connection. And then for each VPC, you would go ahead and spin up your own VLAN interface and be able to connect that back to a VPN gateway. Uh, at the beginning, it seems a little bit strange, but um, once you go through the workflow, we found it quite easy to do. Uh, so maybe there's two to four to six 10 gig links, but that could be shared across 20, 30 different VPCs. Uh, and it was very flexible for us to do. And then uh, connecting uh, between the uh, AWS uh, routers and then our routers, uh, not only do we use BGP to do announcement, so if we choose to move our subnet, it's very easy to move, uh, but it also supports a protocol called BFD, or bidirectional forward detection. Um, this is basically a little echo message that's sent between the routers back and forth at, at a sub-second uh, rate, so you can know if that uh, route connection fails instead of the protocol connection. So BGP uses TCP. It can take you know, 30 or more seconds to figure out the connections down. Players are sad, sad face, they're not being able to play the game and have a good time. BFD is able to very quickly uh, detect it. We did run into some issues where we were overloading the links, and then due to that, we lost B BFD messages. Uh, we did enable, uh, end up enabling some quas or quality of service to uh, prevent that from happening. Um, but we had you know, a peak flow, some new feature or something came out, players are going crazy, they're logging in, and then platform drops. And then because we lost BGP uh, link, we lost the route to that different environment. Um, so we'll have a few more comments on that uh, towards the end of, end of the deck. Um, so our load testing flow, we want to experience this as if we, these were players coming into this platform. We start with our load test harness, as we kind of described earlier in the slides. That goes out Amazon's AWS internet gateway to the Amazon internet backbone uh, and to wherever they connect into the internet. This ultimately goes over the public internet to Riot Direct to be able to test uh, doing DDoS mitigation and other uh, secret sauce we use there to ensure players uh, don't get disconnected from games. That goes through our load balancing edge, <clears throat> which then goes over the direct connect, which then goes through our VPC. So when we launch this, we know exactly how this will work. We can talk to Riot Direct, get their information, talk to the Riot load balancing team, get their information, and have no surprises when we launch this. And we can even test it to two, three, four times what we would expect from a, a, you know, a day or a peak or even through a new feature launch. Uh, so we know exactly how every level of this will work. And then in the end, what's gonna happen is when those uh, bad times or you know, intense play times occur, each one of these teams is familiar with what's gonna happen to their equipment. There's not gonna be a surprise. So if they'll see a peak of traffic, they've already seen it for, before during this load testing process, which is very critical for us. Uh, lastly here around AWS, uh, I've never seen a tool, a service, a system that didn't have issues. Uh, you know, these things can happen, and I just want to provide some key challenges we ran into, uh, ultimately were resolved. Um, we mentioned the lost VPN gateways. This is primarily done through BFD messages being stuck or being lost. Um, that was a, a particular issue for us. Uh, we also ran into an issue where the BGP connection went down between our routers and, that, and the uh, VPN gateways. Ultimately, what we had to do was detach the VPN gateway from the VPC and reattach it, uh, and then it ended up restoring it, something on the back end and AWS's side. Um, it wasn't particularly a big deal uh, for us to do, but it was just more of the uh, hour or so to kind of figure out what happened uh, to that VPN gateway. Uh, ultimately, Amazon support was very helpful for this, and they got into the routers on their side and figured it all out. Um, but if you run into these types of issues, uh, detaching and reattaching uh, uh, definitely can help out. It takes maybe a minute to do, so there could be a service interruption. But if your service is already down, it doesn't hurt to try it. Uh, a couple typical AWS or really virtualization things, uh, instances got stuck or lost. Um, this can happen for a variety of reasons. Uh, so again, I don't know, it always happens in the beginning. Initially, we ran some uh, database servers, some uh, backend application API apps. They would get stuck. We were unable to uh, communicate with them. So just uh, stopping or restarting them helped. Uh, in some instances, we had to terminate or have AWS do hard termination for them. Uh, you know, these things happen, so be prepared for it. Uh, never have one server that does everything. We certainly didn't, that was very helpful for us. Um, so no service outages from that. 
Um, managing and scaling instances, like I mentioned. Uh, initially, we launched shards that were a bit too big for their typical CCU. Um, but over time, we were able to refactor that and ultimately reduce the number of instances that we had in the environment. What I love about AWS is, again, like none of this is free, as nothing ever is. Uh, they definitely want to work with you to get the right size optimization. So we, de we did a lot of that. And that helped us uh, not only on a costing perspective, but also on a uh, scaling and management perspective. Now we have a very good understanding of what everything looks like, so we work through that. Um, initially, when doing load tests, we not only test uh, Riot's edge out, uh, uh, load balancers, but we also test ELBs inside of the VPCs. Uh, for This is for some backend services. We had issues where we're going from zero to a million players. Uh, the ELBs wouldn't scale up fast enough. Uh, we worked with AWS and a few of their architects to be able to solve this problem. Uh, that was awesome uh, process to go through. And then we just kind of found that if we're going to do some testing, we wanted to be able to pre-warm them uh, as we're needing to scale. Um, that was a particular, uh, again, easy process, no issues now, and we have some scripts and tools to be able to help with that. Uh, we mentioned the flapping direct connects, which occurred to the BFD, uh, very fun process. Um, I, I've done a lot of work in networking, so I'm very uh, grateful to have that knowledge, uh, but it's amazing too for to see AWS support all of these deep uh, networking capabilities. Uh, you know, things like IPv6 as well that have come out, so it's good to be able to have, you know, not only BF BGP types of connections, but also BFD. So also recommend always using that. And then lastly, uh, as occurs, uh, we lost some uh, EBS volumes uh, in the beginning. Unfortunately, again, those were on high-end production databases, and it was a very sad time. We had no service outages because of it. We ended up implementing an HADB solution uh, from ScaleArc to, to be able to solve this problem, again, to be able to be a cloud or platform agnostic. Um, ultimately, these things happen, and again, unfortunately, only happened really in the beginning. So, after all this, after nearly nine months of work, blood, sweat, and tears, what are the results here? So from a Terraform perspective, uh, this is not current to today, but within the last month, uh, over 1,800 commits on that repository. Uh, this comes through, I believe, <clears throat> around 25 different contributors uh, to be able to uh, contribute back into it, and then uh, nearly uh, 400 pull requests uh, that have been done through that. So as we work with each different team, they're able to request and make the changes that they want. Uh, for me, this was a big win. Uh, I just hate the manual process of email Rob or email Joe, and then we'll go through and do this thing. Forget that. Let's get rid of the let's get rid of humans and these things that they can make mistakes on. So this uh, the Terraform management and then ultimately the Packer management. The numbers are much less interesting, but uh, this was a huge success for us. Uh, so building that workflow uh, through manual uh, code changes through Docker Jenkins validation and application, huge win. Uh, I cannot recommend that enough. Um, lastly, on the uh, instances size here, on the left, we see uh, the servers uh, and what they're, how many servers we'd have physically, and we'll just break this down and say a small into a large shard. Um, so these are in the amount of devices we'd have to ship, rack, stack, power, care, love for. Um, on the right, the number of instances, we're able to trim down a large shard uh, by almost 100 nodes, which is huge for us. And again, in locations where we have bare metal, we now have a better scaling mechanism to determine uh, how we can build that shard out and reducing the number of nodes for it. Uh, and then on the small side, the difference is not that much, uh, just because we have a lot of redundancy built in. Uh, and so really for us, uh, uh, we didn't, uh, we were able to, able to reduce that under 100 which, uh, as of yet, but hopefully in the future, if we look at some different scaling techniques or as we move to microservices. And then time. The, the ultimate uh, you know, friend slash battle that you're gonna have in life before, again, taking up to nine months to launch a shard. Once the machine in the, or the team that's, that would do these types of migrations, we can now do these types of migrations and changes in a month or less, which is a 9x difference. Uh, I did the math. Uh, and so <clears throat> this not only comes down to technology, which again, I think tech is, in my opinion, very easy. It's uh, validatable, you can ensure, you can do experiments, it, you know, tech has no feelings into it. It's just really being able to align all the teams to go through, do their validation. Um, really the tech enabled that by being able to do pull requests, reviews, um, the, the centralized configuration management through Echo. Uh, all of that, uh, to me, was a huge win. Uh, very, very proud of that. Uh, so I would like to thank Richard, who, who had done a lot of work on that, and then some new folks who've come over to take over that task. Uh, for me, uh, I'd rather do all the tech stuff. It was just really a Herculean task to get everybody together. So uh, we've come to the end of my talk today. We have a few minutes for questions. Uh, so if you would like to line up at the mics, or I'll uh, hang out a bit uh, outside uh, after. 
Um, for me, you know, a couple really good takeaways is uh, in automation, uh, so this is something I've worked on for the last four or five years across different companies. Um, I don't care what tool it is, I don't care what it does, I don't care how cool and hip it is. Uh, there is never a silver bullet in how that works. For me, it's about finding a tool that aligns with your environment, that aligns with how people think in your organization and what can be consumed. So whether it's Ansible Chef, Puppet, Terraform, Packer, whatever the thing that's about to come out tomorrow is, um, just find something that aligns with your environment. And then two, uh, as you're, whatever you're doing, take a lot of time up front to just test, uh, make some mistakes, because you want to make those mistakes before you go into production. Uh, and so have those arguments, have those uh, you know, fist fights or hard discussions. Uh, and then before you go into production, just make sure that uh, you're very confident in your design. The worst thing you do is, uh, you can do in my opinion, is make something like, hey, it looks good, thumbs up, let's ship it. And then what you just decided upon is gonna cause you a year or more of tech debt and pain. And that's pain like I'm happy to take on as an engineer, but that's pain I never wanna give to my players. So ultimately, uh, thank you for spending your morning with me. Uh, this is my favorite project uh, at Riot. Totally love working on it. And uh, uh, happy to go with some questions here. Uh, who wants to go first? Uh, I'll go first. Hey, thanks, a lot of great information in your talk. Um, question I had was, did you guys look at containerization at all of um, either Kubernetes or, or uh, you mentioned Docker earlier. I don't know if you guys are. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so we have uh, the Riot Container Engine or R cluster. Um, that was originally built with its own custom scheduler called Admiral. Uh, we are uh, moving that over into DCOS uh, in the long run. Um, ultimately, let's say it's two, three years from now when I come and give this talk, all of these services uh, will be in microservices. And that will make the process of man maintaining and managing this a lot easier. All right. Great. Thank you. No problem. About your use cases for Packer uh, versus Chef? Uh, sure. So in the Chef side, uh, we do have Chef, and I believe we're running currently Chef 12. Um, we have a layer on top of that, which we call Merlin, and how we build the, pr the packages and whatnot. Um, ultimately, I think just because some of the frustrations with that, uh, that kind of led to Chef having a bad taste in the organization. And uh, people were very big on Packer and, and HashiCorp, and so it just became, I think, like the new hot thing to be able to solve it. I think if we went with a pure Chef solution, it could have solved the problem a lot easier, but um, we had some projects to kick that off. But unfortunately, just due to the, the sour taste of Chef, it didn't work out for us. So you guys have kind of deprecated Chef. Uh, so Chef was still used. I think ultimately the deprecation of Chef will occur once everything is fully uh, microservice uh, built out. Thanks. Yep. Hello. Hey, Hello. thanks, Rob. Great talk. Thank you. What do you guys do for monitoring observability between all those services? Sure. So, so we have our own data pipeline that we built um, to be able to collect all of our metrics, and then we graph them, I believe, through Grafana. And then we have a service called Alerterus. We had a time where everything ended with OUS. So Alerterus will be able to monitor that and give us information and send that over to PagerDuty ultimately and then let us know what's happening. Um, I think it's taken years for us to get the right metrics and to validate everything. But now for the platform, I can say like we, we know that thing inside and out and how it'll work. Um, and then the microservices world, it's way easier to even be able to solve that problem. But it uses the same pipeline that we have inside of Riot. Thanks. So uh, um, assuming I read your high-level architecture diagram correctly, it looks like you're not running any of the actual game servers in AWS. Is that uh, just due to geography, or are there any other reasons for that? Uh, geography and then some concern around virtualization and its timing capabilities. Um, ultimately, we did test them and run games and played, and it worked fine. We probably played maybe 50 games in that way. Uh, I don't believe there's any issue in why it wouldn't work. But for us, really having the geography as close to the player and then connecting into the Riot Direct backbone was the biggest win for us in that case. Great. Thanks a lot. Yep. Hey, uh, thanks, thanks for your time today. So uh, you talked a little bit about how you decided to skip the managed database services like Aurora and RDS to deliver a more consistent experience. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit more about how you ended up architecting your uh, database solution if you rolled it yourself? If that's behind the veil of secrecy, then that's fine. But. Uh, it's a bit secret, but we'll say we use the tool uh, from ScaleArc, which provides uh, AMIs you spin up and then provides the load balancing services. Okay, cool. Thank yep. you. No problem. Uh, happy to answer the two more questions, but just to let everybody know, in a minute and a half, we have to vacate the room so the next team uh, can come in. Uh, go ahead. My question is about testing strategies. Uh -huh. When you were building out Packer and Terraform, were you able to apply to any test-driven development or automated testing, or what strategies did you use? 
uh, ultimately, uh, in the beginning, it was all manually done, but ultimately we have an ability with a build pipeline to build our image, load it up an image, and then do some testing to ensure it works correctly. So like manually after it's built in the pipeline? Uh, initially manually, but now we have that step automated. So the Packer pipeline will build, launch the instance, it'll connect to it via SSH, do some various tests, and then ensure that it's working for us. I can say it could be better. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, last question. Um, I wanted to ask if, based off your experiences with Terraform, if you could go back and use something else, would you? And uh, I'm happy to take my answer offline. Uh, so I would say uh, I would love to explore different tool sets. Uh, Terraform did work very well for us, but now that we have experienced it you know, greatly, the good and the bad, uh, there are some folks who are looking at potential alternatives for us in the long run. I would say making that change into these environments would be very tough to do, just given we have the workflows. Uh, but uh, that's an area I'm, I'm very interested in exploring. Really, and so, so, so for someone coming in fresh who isn't using anything like that, do you think Terraform's the way to go th still? Uh, absolutely, if I had to pick one tool right now, and at least from the ones I'm familiar with, Terraform would be the way to go. Uh, and f for me, the big win is the code you write for AWS obviously cannot be used in Azure or bare metal, um, but the uh, tool set that they have and the, pi and the way that they have plug-in model today in, in 011, I would totally go with it. So definitely check out the book, Terraform Up and Running. I did not write it in order to get a cut of it, but I think it's a great book to get started on. Thank you. Yep. All right, thanks everybody. Uh, enjoy the rest of your time here.